Good morning, and thank you all for joining us on this third day of our 18th Genomics Forum. I'm Sally Greenwood, Vice President Communications and Societal Engagement at Genome BC. We've had a great couple of days, lots of excellent science and public health strategies shared and very exciting and insightful audience participation. So please continue with that today. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that Genome BC offices are located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. We are privileged and honored to do our work on these beautiful lands. Today, we're gonna shift gears and focus on science communications. This is truly a time like no other. The role of traditional and social media cannot be underestimated. <clears throat> and to help us wade through this murky time, we have a stellar lineup of journalists, physicians, social scientists, and social media influencers. So please join us for as much of today as you can. Just a few housekeeping items. The session is being recorded, and we ask that you post your questions via the show Q&A to the right of your screen and upvote your favorites. We will have time for your questions at the conclusion of our keynote today. I am fortunate to introduce today's keynote speaker, Roxanne Kamsey. Roxanne is an independent science journalist whose articles have appeared in publications such as The Economist, Wired Magazine, Nature, Scientific American, New Scientist, and The New York Times. She has received wide recognition for her work, including the American Medical Writers Association's Walter C. Alvarez Award and multiple first place awards for the, from the Association of Healthcare Journalists. Roxanne's reporting has been featured on television and radio programs such as CBS News and WNYC's On the Media Show. She has taught health reporting and science communication at Stony Brook University's Allen Alda Center and the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism in New York. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Roxanne. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, it is a real pleasure to be with everyone today. And I wanted to start first and foremost by thanking Genome BC for um, allowing me to chat with everybody about responsible journalism, um, particularly given everything that's happened in this past year. So with that, I'm gonna switch over and share my uh, slides here and go into present mode. So I'm talking today about reporting on evolving evidence because that's really what's happened in this pandemic. Um, we've been writing about uh, a lot of science that's been changing on the fly, uh, or at least data that's coming in that is evolving. And um, so without further ado, I just wanted to say a little bit more about how I've been covering this so that people have a context for the kinds of stories that I've written. So as you can see, um, as Sally mentioned, I've written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Nature, Wired, and these are all articles about different aspects of this, this pathogen, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and how it's changing. Um, and I am also based here in Canada. This is a photo of me in my natural habitat in Montreal. Thankfully, um, it's getting a little bit warmer these days, so you won't see me sitting on a bench quite so cold. So I want to take everyone back to uh, late December 2019. This for me was a moment as a journalist where uh, my antennas kind of got a, a wind of something that was a little bit unusual. So Helen Branswell, who I've followed for many years and writes for Stat News um, and is an amazing health journalist, had a uh, this this thing that she put on Twitter saying, you know, hopefully this is nothing out of the ordinary, but a ProMed male posting about unexplained pneumonias in China is giving me SARS flashbacks. And of course, Helen, as many people might know, covered SARS, the original SARS outbreak in, in 2013. So um, she was very familiar with this. And uh, a lot of us health journalists started to feel like, wait a second, what's this? That something might be going on. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about how when you're in a pandemic, or, or, and this applies to anything, how you will report responsibly. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk for a second about uh, something that people probably do every day, or at least I do, and I should disclose that bias, and how it's reported in the health journalism space. So I'm going to tell a story about teeth for a second. Um, so we can take a break from the pandemic and, and think about uh, our oral health. So uh, back in 2016, the New York Times reported on this big uh, report that the Associated Press had, had um, issued. And the, the headline was feeling guilty about flossing, maybe there's no need. 
And um, this is the, the Associated Press uh, article that, that set this off, said medical benefits of dental floss are unproven. So uh, this, this happened because uh, the Associated Press looked into the evidence. Uh, of course, this is about reporting responsibly. So they looked into the evidence and they found that uh, when flossing first gained acceptance, no proof was required of remedies. Dentist uh, Levi Spear Palmy is credited with inventing floss in the early 19th century. By the time the first floss patent was issued in 1874, the applicant noted that dentists were widely recommending its use. So the ADA, which is the American Dental Association, has been promoting floss universally since 1908. Um, so what the AP did was they said, look, there's no evidence that the flossing um, works. And they went actually beyond that to say floss can occasionally cause harm. So careless flossing can damage gums, teeth, and dental work. Though frequency is unclear, floss can dislodge bad bacteria and invade the bloodstream and cause dangerous infections, especially in people with weak immunity, according to the medical literature. So, so in the context of this evidence about this thing that a lot of us do all the, all the time, uh, suddenly we were being told to question this practice. And there were like a whole bunch of news stories that came out after this. So you have the BBC saying, you know, should you floss? Self Magazine said flossing might be, not be as important as you think. The Guardian said everyone recommends flossing, but there's hardly any proof it works. Um, and so myself and other flossers out there were shaken to the core by this. And um, it really shows how one story from the Associated Press kind of took on this whole life of coverage. So this is gonna bring me to a point that um, kind of a, 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 a sentence or phrase that I've been thinking about so much since Helen's tweet uh, last December, or not last December, but December, 2019. And that is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, now this quote is something that uh, when I looked into it deeply was attributed to the Dugald Bell, this person who was writing in the Glacialists magazine back in 1895. Now it might be that somebody said it before that. Um, it's actually most commonly attributed to Martin Rees, who's a British cosmologist um, and astrophysicist. But I think that if I can convey anything to um, scientists, the public, other journalists, is that this thing is, is first and foremost, at least in my mind, when I'm navigating uh, a topic like the SARS-CoV-2 virus, because, you know, honestly, there is an absence of evidence very often. And so, um, you know, we, we have to wonder how we're conveying messages uh, after that. So um, this is what happened with the flossing story. So this wonderful piece came out in Wired by Matt Simon. And he said, hey, sorry, everyone, but you should probably keep flossing. So, uh, you know, so why, keep propagating this myth about flossing. He said, uh, why force the public to stick their hands in their mouths? Well, because the effectiveness of flossing isn't proven. It's also not disproven, at least not yet. Scientists are still gathering string and it's proving difficult. So he made a little pun there. He's forgiven for that. Um, and uh, sorry, let me just move this down here. Um, so he said, in the lab, scientists have found that flossing does indeed reduce inflammation and bleeding uh, of the gums, indications that it could theoretically head off gum disease, theoretically. But these studies only lasted weeks, not nearly enough time to track the development of long-term disease. So what I think that he's done really beautifully here is he's kind of contextualized the absence of evidence. And I think that uh, journalists, we can, we can do this really well if we're careful about our uh, conveyance of the science is we, we kind of contextualize what evidence is there and what's not. So something might not be proven, but it might not also be disproven. And I, I'm gonna walk you guys through how I think that plays out in this pandemic. So um, flashback again, I know we're kind of going back and forth in time, but let's go back to March of last year. This is um, the WHO in the end of March, 2020. And they said, fact, COVID is not airborne. The coronavirus is mainly transmitted through droplets generated when an infectious person coughs, sneezes, or speaks. Now, this came out two weeks after I had reported a story um, saying they say coronavirus isn't airborne, but it's definitely borne by air. And this came out in Wired on the 14th of March. So again, two weeks before. And the reason I wrote this story was that I was kind of obsessed with the absence of evidence and also kind of responsible reporting on science um, in, in that situation. 
So what I did was I kind of looked back and I tried to contact, I tried to do um, what, Mar what the Wired story about flossing had done uh, four years before, which was to kind of contextualize, you know, that there is some evidence that coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS can travel in hospital air. Um, some scientists still dispute this data. MERS research, for example, did not use a hospital room where infectious patients uh, as a control, but others take it as a given that these coronaviruses were floating in their infectious form around the parts of hospitals. So before the world was kind of sure that, as we know now, this new SARS-CoV-2 virus can spread in the air, what I was hoping to do as a journalist is to contextualize the um, lack of evidence we have, but also why some scientists think one thing and sometimes scientists think another. Um, and so I unpack this a little bit more and I talk about how uh, in um, uh, Singapore, there was this study that had been found just very early on in our current pandemic. Uh, the study offered some solace because it didn't find evidence of the virus in air samples. However, the air vent blades in one patient's room did test positive. So I was kind of, again, saying we, we don't have evidence, but we do have some inkling that there might be something going on. So um, Linda Ware had this uh, wonderful blog in Evidently Cochrane, which is related to the Cochrane Review, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware, um, publishes meta-analyses. And she said, there are some reasons for the evidence of absence. These studies may be too small to detect an effect or difference. The effect or difference may be very, very small itself. There may be too few data or not enough studies. The evidence may be of very low quality or the studies may have been poorly designed. I think number five is like something that I think about a lot. So um, journalists, scientists, scientists commenting on other people's work, scientists thinking about the context of research that we're, we're operating in will wanna kind of think about this. Um, and I wanted to, again, kind of take it back a little bit to, uh, you know, genomics and this pandemic. And here is uh, a little bit of what happened months later when the variant first identified in the UK came out. You'll see this uh, NBC news story. It says Colorado reports first confirmed case of UK coronavirus variant. And I want you to pay attention to the subheading, which says it is believed to be more contagious, but not more lethal than other strains. So in some ways, it's not just about responsible journalism, but it's also about responsible headlines and things like that. So I think that this, oftentimes the journalists don't write the headlines. Um, I was an editor in a past life, so I sympathize with editors who have to distill this stuff down. But you'll notice it says it's not more lethal, which if you were reading this in late December when it came out, you would think, you know, okay, I'm reassured. But if you look more closely at the article itself, it says the newly identified variant doesn't appear to be more deadly. So huh, it's not that it's not more deadly. It doesn't appear to be more deadly. All of these small words, I think are really important when we're doing responsible journalism so that we can kind of hit the nail on the head instead of uh, getting it wrong. So what happened months later, so this is March of this year, uh, is that there was, it, the story evolved as, as it happens. And there were reports that came out that said it was significantly higher death rate reported for the coronavirus first de detected in the UK. So um, I think if we wanna be responsible, we have to contextualize things to say, this is a possibility um, without scaring people, which is another consideration. Um, a quick last example. So this is another article I wrote about, you know, how long does the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus last in people? Um, when I started reporting this piece, which ran in Elemental, there was this kind of mantra that it didn't last longer than 10 days or so. Um, you know, some people thought there might be outliers. And so I, I wanted to talk to scientists and find out really what is the, how long can it last? And so um, I spoke with scientists and the last sentence here, uh, you know, mentions that they found one patient who was moderately immunocompromised and had the infectious virus for 20 days. So I was trying to look and report responsibly with this absence of evidence. And um, as we know now, people, especially people who are immunocompromised, can carry the virus for uh, more than 100 days or so. So I think uh, when journalists are writing about new viruses, about genetics, about anything unknown, we kind of have to have that context in our stories. I think that's super important. And I think scientists speaking to journalists will wanna also kind of think context, context, context. So quickly, part two, um, I'm gonna try to do this in 
five to eight minutes, super fast. So um, the, the other element uh, I wanted to touch on today in terms of reporting responsibly is this area of preprints, uh, which is a kind of a jargon term, but what it refers to is papers that have been posted online, but not formally vetted by peers uh, and, and run in a science journal. So you might have noticed that some of the examples I shared of my own writing here, uh, there is the mention that, um, you know, that in the middle of this paragraph, you can see a new study from the Netherlands, which has not yet undergone review by other scientists. I think as science journalists, health reporters, responsible journalism is conveying whether or not the findings have been vetted by other scientists. So that's why I put that clause there. Um, similarly here, I, I mentioned the word preprint. I said a second study described in a preprint paper published March 10th. Um, so I would really advocate for all scientists and all journalists to make it super clear when something has just only been posted online as opposed to published in a journal. And again, for those that aren't familiar, the kind of traditional publishing uh, pathway was you submitted it to us, this particularly for health and, and science and, and genetics and things like that, you would submit to a journal, uh, it would be reviewed, then it would go online after being vetted. Now we have this um, world with preprints where things just kind of, uh, you can post whatever you want in a way. And there's very high quality preprints. I just wanna say that there's extra vetting. Um, so this is a little bit about how journalists found studies before the, the rise of preprints, which has really taken off this past year. I, I, I definitely wanna convey that this is something new. Um, so before we would get weekly table of contents, email alerts or press releases, uh, we would look around in PubMed or we would go to conferences. Um, and now it's something we find on Twitter. Sometimes somebody says, oh, I just posted this online or, um, you know, you can search preprint servers or sometimes you're talking to a scientist and they will just share it with you directly. Um, I spoke with a bunch of other science journalists. I wrote this piece for the Open Notebook last year. Um, and it was kind of as we were grappling with how to do this uh, new, how to operate in this new landscape. And um, here are some of the things that my peers said to me. Uh, Christy Ishwanen, who writes for Nature and uh, other uh, high profile places, she said, uh, where I've seen reporters go wrong on this is when they sort of grab these preprints because they want to be first. We do have pressure to be first and to break news. And I think preprints seem to offer the shiny opportunity to do that. But most of the time, that's not really going to pan out. So, um, you know, a lot of times, sometimes these preprints make grand claims. And what Christy is trying to say here is, be super conscious that they that these grand claims might not pan out and you've got to be diligent about that in getting comment from other people. Um, Penny Sarchett, who's the news editor of New, Times, New Scientist said, you know, we don't automatically treat preprints like they're much lower in quality than peer reviewed published papers. Uh, we don't believe peer review to be a gold standard that guarantees uh, the science holds up. So she's kind of making the very great point that you know as much as we not need to report responsibly on preprints we also need to bear in mind that even peer-reviewed studies uh, that come out on the virus or anything else they also uh, might not pan out in the long term so all it's all about getting that context and really stopping to say you know uh, how can I get people to to put this in the bigger picture? Um, I also, since we're talking about social media today and, and, and we're living in a social media age, I, one of the people I spoke with for my article, this is an excerpt from that article, was Ed Young. And um, he mentioned that it can be risky for reporters to tweet about preprints they haven't reported on themselves. I think about this every day. Um, and so he's cautioning journalists against tweeting about a preprint manuscript or even a published paper they found if they haven't done the reporting on the work. Um, to do so is functionally equivalent to writing a story without talking to anyone, which I think we can all agree is a bad idea, is what he told me. He said, there may be a time when this practice was acceptable and when journalists could use Twitter as a means of reporting, as kind of canvassing or testing ideas, but that is no longer the time. Or th this is no longer the time. And I think what, what Ed was trying to say is that the stakes are so high when we're tweeting about a virus or the genetics of a virus and what that might mean, that you can't just tweet uh, and say, oh, I, I, I wonder if this preprint is true because it might set off a reaction that you don't want. Um, as I wrap up, I was just gonna point to the fact that it's not journalists alone that are grappling with this. Um, the FDA or and the health regulators around the world are kind of trying to understand 
whether or not, you know, how, how to make decisions on drugs and things like that and approvals based on data that's coming in so fresh. So um, there has been some, this is an example with regards to blood plasma, which was used to treat COVID-19 patients. And, um, you know, so, so it's, it's not isolated to journalism. This question of preprints is broad and I'm sure uh, stirring debate everywhere. My last two slides are um, something that I want to bring to everyone's attention because I, I love this. This is something that I use in my teaching, which is, um, this comes from Health News Review. And uh, they would, this is a site that would used to review science articles, uh, journal, science journalism to say whether it was high quality. And some of the, here's some of the criteria they use. Um, it, does it adequately discuss the costs of the intervention? Does it quantify the benefits of the intervention? Does it quantify the harms of the intervention? Does it seem to grasp the quality of the evidence? So that, that echoes back to what Linda had written um, on her uh, evidently Cochrane uh, post that I pointed to earlier. Um, does it commit disease, disease monger mongering? Uh, does it talk to independent sources? Does it compare the new approach with existing alternatives? Um, and so on. So here, here's a, a lot of great points. And then I decided I would add to this just a few, four um, final additional pandemic criteria. So in my heart, in my mind, uh, one, some of the questions I ask about whether um, something is responsible journalism is, does it accommodate the fact that scientists might not have all the evidence in hand? And that's what I was pointing to with this grappling of reporting in an absence of evidence. Um, and then secondly, does it avoid exaggerating risks that contribute to vaccine hesitancy? Now, that's something that we're all super, super focused on right now as, as we're rolling out vaccines. Does it avoid downplaying risks that contribute to complacency? So again, we're, we journalists are kind of walking this fine line and I, I wanna caution anyone who's writing about these type of things to avoid um, at the same time exaggerating, but also downplaying risks. Um, because as we saw with the airborne example, you know, we don't wanna downplay risks if, if we don't have all the evidence yet. Um, lastly, uh, I think we were talk just talking about preprints of so this make might make sense to folks about why I care about it. So the fourth um, criterion here is, do we, does it adequately specify if a study is published or still not peer reviewed? So these are all the things I've been thinking about. It's been a really uh, tough uh, pandemic to report on, but I hope that um, everything I've shared today has kind of given people a little bit of an insight into why uh, why it's been that way. So thank you very much. Uh, if you wanna follow me or ask any questions, I'm always on Twitter, uh, speaking of social media. So this is a great way to, to find me So with that. Fantastic. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, there's some really great questions coming through. So if it's okay with you, I think we'll just uh, get into some of those. The first question is with so many sources available online, what evidence gathering process would you recommend to the public before deciding something is fact? Sorry, I muted myself. That's a, a wonderful question. Um, oftentimes we journalists don't think about that because we're so stuck in like looking at PubMed, which is like this database of science uh, papers. But what I, I do when I'm looking for um, non-technical sources of information is I've kind of created lists for myself on Twitter. I don't know people might not use Twitter, but you can create a list of trusted news sources or trusted journalists that have gotten things right in the past and that you know do all of the things that I was just talking about. So with that health news review checklist, is that person that you're reading, have they done the thing like um, contextualized whether this treatment is better than other treatments or have they spoken with more than one independent source. So, you know, you've kind of got to have, have this news literacy when you're reading a story. Have they spoken with just the scientists that did the study or did they do the legwork to kind of get comment from a couple other folks to say whether it's good research or not? And also are the scientists who they are reporting on doing work in their own space? Or is it somebody who's maybe a statistician who decided they would write a paper about a virus, which you know, unless they're doing viral st statistics, they might want to steer clear of people who are doing work outside their, their zone. Does that help answer the question? 
Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think uh, obviously a challenge perhaps for a lay person is this um, opportunity to kind of do your reporting, to dig down and to, and to kind of find accurate information and to have your list. I mean, it's a bit, it, I would suggest it's a little bit challenging for lay people to be doing that. I mean, they're trying to catch information as it's flowing, you know, and, and they're in their busy lives and they're doing their, their things. And one of the, the biggest concerns now with, with social media and with, with uh, traditional reporting is everything is in a minute 30 soundbite or a 200 characters or less. And so when we think, when we're thinking about that, when we're thinking about that kind of bombardment of, of fast food, if you will, <laughs> in journalism, do you have any tips on that? I mean, um, can they, can they depend on uh, their local media outlet to be doing this kind of digging in the background that you're talking about? Because a lot of your work is, is that real investigative work. Thank you for calling it investigative because I, I refer to it as such, you know, so oftentimes people think of investigative journalism as not looking through science papers, but I, I, I do believe it is. I think that um, I actually think a lot of local reporting has been really good in this pandemic. Um, I've, I've relied on it to find out what's on the ground, but I do hear what you're saying in terms of sometimes the scientific rigor of, of uh, some reporting isn't uh, as deep as you might find, say, in the pages that the, the news stories of nature, where a lot of the, you know, the, the readership is scientific. So those stories are geared to kind of dig into that. Um, it is, it is, and the soundbite question is also very true. People kind of distill things down. And I hope that the example I showed about um, the variant identified in the UK kind of brings to mind this exact conundrum, because I think what a lot of uh, news outlets were trying to do was to tell people that we didn't have the whole picture. But unfortunately, in doing so, they kind of distilled it down into saying, oh, it's not more deadly, even though the larger point was we don't know yet and such like that. So I think that um, maybe one solution is to kind of complement. Uh, so if you read a story that you that that seems too simple to kind of um, have that guard up, but I, I, can't, I can't say that there's any sort of uh, vaccine you can take against these, <laughs> these stories that come out because they do come out. And, uh, you know, frankly, even I have to kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's extra work for me. We've all been doing extra work in this pandemic to, to know what hits right. Okay, great answer. So um, maybe linked to that is a question that says, what, did, what does a journalist do when the facts used in a previous story they wrote have been changed or debunked? Um, so I think that one thing you do is you call your editor and you say, hey, can I do a follow-up study? I mean, if it's, a, if it's, a, if it's something like a, a name was misspelled or, you know, I actually, I, I wrote this story for The Atlantic about blood clots and I misunderstood. I thought that there was a certain um, aspect of the science where the um, I, I, I mistook um, a protein splicing thing for a, a, a DNA or sorry, RNA splicing event. And so I, I called my editor very terrified saying like, I got this technical science thing off and we did run a correction. Um, so you can, you can correct things like that. My mind uh, often kind of uh, gravitates to protein or RNA when it should do the opposite, which uh, some someday I'll get past that. Um, but I do think follow-up stories have a place. And I think that, um, you know, one of the great things about the web is you can actually link back to things. So right. creating that ecosystem of, of information and, and even linking to other people's stories where there's an evolving um, picture. So I think that journalists have a responsibility to revisit topics when they turn out to have gotten it wrong. And, and we're all doing that, you know. So this is an interesting question. Um, it, it is, what do you recommend to get journalists science literate or more literate? But it's interesting because as a journalist myself in my previous life, I would also add to that. And what can we do to get scientists more lay literate and make their work more accessible. So you can you can kind of respond to that uh, from either perspective or both. Wonderful questions that I obsess about all the time. <laughs> um, part of the reason I'm so evangelical on Twitter about, you know, uh, here's what an antibody is, or, you know, like, here's what um, 
how here's how gene works because I think that uh, you know this is not easy stuff. Like so, so, like I don't expect every single reporter out there to know about transcription and translation, like these elements of what happens to how genes become proteins. That's that's stuff that health reporters might know, but the the beat reporter that's writing about the vaccination site that just opened on their you know block might not know. So I think. Um, to the question of what can science journalists do to become more science literate is actually, I would say, you know, sure, if you have time to read all these books about DNA and RNA, sure, more power to you. But the biggest thing they can do is to not be afraid when speaking with scientists to ask for their time and also for their to speak on their level um, to uh, you know leave the ego aside and say, hey, I actually. When you're talking about the mutation, I don't actually understand what a mutation is. How, what is a mutation? Um, the other thing I would say that I still do all the time is to use uh, Google images. Uh, I'm a very visual learner. I, I remember being in my physiology class in college and thinking like, oh my God, how does the, how does that neuron actually affect that? What's the axon? Uh, now we can just look at Google images and you can see pathways. You can see how an antibody binds to something. You know, having somebody describe binding of antibodies is, you know, hard for even my brain to understand until I look and I see, oh, it binds that part of the antibody. Oh, okay. So that's how I would say scientists can, uh, journalists can kind of get a little bit of shortcuts to uh, learning about science. The, and obviously like, you know, re reading up online before, whatever, sure. Um, Scientists do need to become more lay uh, centric, I would say. Um, biggest thing they can do is just start with empathy and to ask the journalist that they're speaking with, who is your audience? What, uh, what, kind of, um, what kind of readership am I speaking to? Because then they can think in their mind like who they're talking to. And um, lastly, I'd just say to be hyper vigilant not to use jargon or acronyms because not only will you lose the journalist you're speaking with or the layperson you're talking to, but you know it, it's going to be a missed opportunity if you if you put too much jargon in. Great answers and great tips. How confident are you that journalists are meeting the ethical standards you maintain? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I I'm I'm a. <laughs> I have a lot of friends who are science journalists who I respect immensely. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. So uh, a lot of people, I, I, I turn to a lot of my peers to say, what would you do in this situation? I'm having a question or, you know, so I, I, I'm on the phone sometimes with them. So I, I respect my peers immensely. I would say that, um, you know, in general, maybe I'm an optimist. So I look around and I see people doing great work uh, on deadline. I, I do think that there are some journalists who, I'm not even sure to call them journalists, but some people who are producing content who might not have the same intention that a lot of us other health journalists have, science journalists have, which is to kind of get to the bottom of things and share information. I think that there are some content producers who are looking to make, make money, which is not why I got into journalism, news, news alert. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I think, I think to, um, you know, if, if you're feeling like you're being sold to, or that the person is not, uh, contextualizing things, you might want to, um, question their ethics. I, I think that that's, that's where I get the ethical concerns. Okay. Um, let's see, there's lots of questions here. Speaking to responsible journalism, how do you counter or mitigate other journalists or news sources that may be publishing misleading headlines? Well, I'll write a story. So, I mean, I didn't post it on this slides, but I, I did a piece in early February where I said, um, oh, I, I forget, it was like something like Corona, it's like coronavirus is, is, is like worse, than the flu or something like that. Actually, I, I might look it up just right now. Uh, it said, coronavirus is bad, comparing it to the flu is worse. So I wrote that piece in February, 2020, because I looked around and, and some of my, you know, some of my friends were writing stories that I disagreed with. And I wanted to just say that, hey guys, I have a different point of view, respect. 
but I just have a different point of view. And so I just wrote a different story. I hope that answers the question. It's pretty simple, I think. Like if you see something that you disagree with, but you you can report it and talk to scientists to understand why you disagree, then you know we're all we're all friends, or or we're all we're not all friends, but we're we're all um, you know trying to do the same thing, which is find the truth. Right. Okay. What can scientists do to ensure that the data and overall message reported by journalists aligns with the science? Sorry, can you say that one more time? What can scientists do to ensure that the data and overall message reported by journalists aligns with the science? I think you've really, you've spoken to this quite a bit, but you can. Yeah, I would say, um, I would say to just check in with the journalists as you're speaking with them to say, did you get that? Um, you, you, what you can't do as a science scientist is to ask to review the story. I think sometimes people do that and it's uh, against journalistic standards to show our articles to the sources before we publish, just as you wouldn't want to do for a politician. Um, so I think, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, sometimes you can ask like, what's, what's the top line that's kind of coming out of this or are you getting what I'm saying, but to just make it a conversation between two people. Okay. And we have time for one more question, maybe two. Um, this is a great one. Uh, how as a journalist do you overcome in your reporting inherent biases about the risks of disease that your society has ingrained in you? I love this question so much. Yeah. I love this question. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think there's so much stigma associated with infectious disease that there's such an opportunity to, first of all, educate myself as I'm reporting and to also um, to, to bring my readers along with me. And so I think that making that journey explicit in a story, or not you know about me, but just to kind of share that context of how things have changed historically and why they need to change, why certain groups have been neglected or misunderstood, is, you know, don't shy away from it. Put it front and center in the piece so that um, you acknowledge it rather than kind of just skipping over it to say, okay, this is how things are now. Okay, that's a great answer. Um, all right, you know what? Uh, let's see, we'll have one more question. Um, I'll let you, how do you present scientific complexity when many lay people prefer their news to be simple and clear cut? I am with those, I'm with every single lay person who wants it to be simple and clear cut. Um, I was speaking to a class about this yesterday, actually. Complexity is something I think about a lot. And um, I think that there are ways in which science and health journalists can use, first of all, to, to, to throw jargon out the door. Jargon has no place. I mean, if there's more than one acronym in a paragraph, make a cup of tea and come back to it and try to get rid of that second acronym. Um, you know, even things like um, MS for multiple sclerosis or CF for cystic fibrosis, I, I push back even against editors to say, I don't want two, or two letters. I want the name of the disorder so that, you know, it's, it's not uh, confusing to anyone. Um, so I think that uh, walking away and coming back and saying, what is the basic information that I need to get this across without going over simplifying to use code words that aren't acronyms, but like, um, you know, uh, this, it's all about distilling science. And if you do it right, you're walking a line where you're not scaring off people with, with jargon, but you're also kind of phrasing it in a way where somebody who has maybe a, a, even a PhD in that subject will know what you're talking about. And that's what keeps us employed. That's what makes my job so hard. That's why I sit in front of the computer looking at sentences saying, okay, uh, will, will the, the scientist understand this? And also my friend who's a painter, will they both get this sentence and will they both feel satisfied? Um, you're kind of brokering that. And I think um, it's, it's never gets easier. Is the thing. <laughs> yeah, synthesizing complex information is is an incredible art um, or science, depending on which way you want to look at it. And finding people who can do that uh, in a very in, in a relevant, meaningful way, I think, is is a challenge. Um, one of the things you know, a couple of reporters that I talk to all the time, and certainly I used to do this, um, and we do it at Genome BC in our writing is 
is also using analogy, right? So trying to find examples or analogies that people that are more relatable to people so that they can kind of see the parallel. I will say one thing about that, which is scientists love to give me analogies when I'm on the phone with them. And I'm like, whoa, this is this is not the time for analogy. I need to understand how it really works. And then I will decide what the, what the analogy is. And then also just a final note, which is um, I find since we're talking about genomics and, and journalism, every single time I have to explain a mutation in a rare disease, it go through this process from the start again, because it's never the same. Each mutation uh, related to each rare disorder has its own uh, nuances and, and needs for distilling. Anyway, I'll, I'll shush because I, I could talk about this topic forever. Well, it's really been fantastic. I want to um, obviously uh, thank you very, very much. Um, we are uh, going to, this day is off to a fantastic start and we're gonna continue that way with our next panel, which is called Mitigating an Infidemic. And Roxanne has agreed to stay and join that panel as well. Personally, I can't wait to hear this one because there is just so much there to unravel. Uh, first off, just to note that we will again be recording that session and you are invited to ask questions using the show Q&A to the right of your screen where you can vote your favorites up as well. I'll turn it over to our moderator in just one minute, but first I'd like to introduce him, though he is no stranger to most. Timothy Caulfield is a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy, a professor in the Faculty of Law and the School of Public Health, and Research Director of the Health Law Institute at the University of Alberta. His interdisciplinary research on topics like stem cells, genetics, research ethics, the public representations of science and public health policy has allowed him to publish over 350 academic articles. He's won numerous academic and writing awards and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He contributes frequently to the popular press and is the author of two national bestsellers, The Cure for Everything, untangling the twisted messages about health, fitness, happiness, and happiness, and is one of Paltrow wrong about everything when celebrity culture and science clash. His most recent book is Relax, Damn It, A User's Guide to the Age of Anxiety. Tim is also the host and co-producer of the award-winning documentary TV show, A User's Guide to Cheating Death, which has been shown in over 60 countries, including streaming on Netflix here in North America. Given all the things he does, we are thrilled he was able to join us today. So to participate in this great session, please go to the event hub and click on view session where Tim and the panel are waiting. Enjoy, and I will talk to you later. Thanks very much for joining.